Incorporated, lo located in Germantown, Maryland. Gina is an organizational effectiveness and development consultant and master facilitator with a background in industrial psychology. With over 20 years of experience, Gina has worked with a variety of organizations ensuring that solutions are customized and focused to meet organizational objectives and goals. Her core strengths include client focus, professionalism, flexibility, along with strong business acumen, and delivering consistently high quality results to organizations. Gina serves as the chairperson for Workout to End ALZ and is passionate about raising awareness and research funds for Alzheimer's. Gina, it's once again my pleasure to turn this webinar over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. I appreciate that. Wow, it's so great to be here. I feel very honored to be the first in this series to talk about this important and, and very relevant topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You hear a lot um, about DEI every day in the news and, and in our day-to-day -day work, and we're going to just get a foundation of some of the aspects of DEI so that you walk away with just a working knowledge of what DEI is and maybe some strategies that you can then implement back at your, your organizations or even in your personal lives. So fantastic. So today we're going to really talk about why DEI is more, more important more now than ever. And as you know, we're dealing with the things that are happening in the world that we live in, we know that diversity and equity and inclusion is something that is really pervasive. And we'll talk about the value of DEI as it relates to the workplace and some of the things that get in the way as far as barriers. How do we you know, bridge that, that um, opportunity to make those connections and then get a higher understanding of what that could mean to each one of us, our organizations and some strategies. So when we talk about this particular session, I ask that you are in the moment and be in a judge-free zone. And I know that some of you are already in the space in terms of practicing DEI in your day-to-day -day work. And there's some of you that are brand new. So regardless of where you are, you're welcome whatever the space you're in. Feel free to respond to the poll and the chat. We wanna keep this interactive. So as we're talking, the chat will be active. You might see me turn my head. I just want you to know that I'm not disengaged, that when I turn my head, I'm looking at the chat and that everyone's voice is important and there's room for all of us in this session. Gina, uh, could you swap your views? People are seeing you and they're not really seeing your, the slides at this point. They're not, they're not seeing the slides. I'm, I'm not understanding what you're telling me. They, they're seeing you. And the slides are real tiny. So if you could swap the view. Um, okay. I'm, I'm, I apologize. I don't know exactly what you're telling me. I see it fine. I see it on my, yeah. my other screen. Okay. Thank you. Holly, can you see? I see it fine. Okay. Um, okay, so um, fantastic. So thank you so much for that that wonderful introduction, Holly. Um, just a little bit more about um, my life is that I have worked with over 500 organizations. All of this is there, of course, for you to read. Um, but some of the, the clients that I've worked with have been like NASA, some other um, key um, federal space organizations, Kaiser Permanente. I've worked with Twitter, some gaming companies. I've worked with Rutgers and George Washington Universities. And one of the things that I'm very proud of is being the, a dog mama of the giant poodle. He is 90 pounds, um, Poodlemus Maximus. So you might see him walk behind me at times. So that's a little bit more about me. Now, when we are talking about DEI, I, I can't help but think about sometimes that little voice that, that gets in all of our heads as we interact with people. 
and, and that sense of, of wanting to belong. And I wanted to start out with a video. And I ask that as you watch this video, you just experience it in real time and just reflect on maybe some of your experiences that may or may not relate. So I'm just gonna start right now and launch the video. You know that little voice in your head? you to ignore a tasteless joke. The one that tells you to keep quiet when a client makes a racist comment. The little voice that tells you you're not smart enough because English isn't your first language. You were the only one that hears that voice. But that voice also speaks to other people. It says, You're different. You're an outsider. And you are commitment. Your opinion doesn't matter. Instead of listening to that little voice, you need to find yours and make it heard. So when you think about that video and you think about the voices that are going on in, in all of our heads, so to speak, you think about that sense of not only that connection, the things that are said, the things that are not said, but really how we're feeling. And when we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, it is all about that human connection and the human condition. And also I would add a component to that, which is a sense of belonging. And the need to want to feel as if you belong. So my first poll question for all of you is, how many of you have ever felt like you were in a situation as if you did not belong? So that's just a yes or no. Should appear on the screen. So we had 93% pervasively that said yes. And, and so that can mean a lot of different things. I know in, in my experience, I've been in a lot of situations where I've been the only, the only female in a group, the only person of color in a group, um, the only person of size necessarily in a group. Because I um, part-time have taught um, indoor cycling called spinning. And, and I've been the largest one in the studio and I'm the instructor. So it can be a lot of situations where you feel like you're the only one and you don't have that sense of belonging. And so that's very interesting to see those numbers appear. Second question is, how many of you have ever been in a situation where you might have been the person to make others feel as if they did not belong? And that could be intentional or unintentional. Or maybe just no. Gina, while people are doing the poll, if I may, people are um, on their views. If they double click on the slides, 
it'll bring it down and then they can swap so they can see the slides larger. Oh, okay. So when, when we're thinking about this question, of course, you know, many of us would like to say that we've never been in that situation where, you know, you've made to feel someone feel as if they don't belong. I certainly would like to say that, but I know that I wouldn't be truthful to myself. Um, even like going through school, you know, going through high school, those cliques and in and, and college, you know, fraternities, sororities, um, joining organizations, there, there's been opportunities where you might have unintentionally made people feel as if they did not belong, or even asking someone a question like, you know, where are you from? And then, you know, because of curiosity, you might say, no, where are you really from? Because of how they appear, that question in itself could indicate that they feel as if they don't belong. Like, why are you asking me that question? So I really appreciate this, this answer here that, you know, people saying, yes, I did, but not intentionally. And those who said, yes, thank you for those answers. So fantastic. So we think about um, DEI from a perspective of an evolution and where did it come from? And where we started is back all the way in the 1960s, almost 60 years ago now or more, where we were focused on equal opportunity, eliminating discrimination and less risk of um, legal compliance and, and trying to open up this world of promoting equal opportunity. And then we got to the point in the 70s and 80s of affirmative action, evolving into the 90s, where we, we brought this word into the focus of diversity to include things as protection against religion, cultural backgrounds, LGBT at the time, different ways of thinking, creating affinity groups and resources to today, where we are now including it for diversity, equity, and inclusion so that we can evolve as organizations, as people, um, evolutionary recruitment and retention and engagement, which is the most important aspect of it. Trying to make sure that we are tapping into the collective brilliance of the tapestry of everyone that's out there. So that gives us kind of an evolution. That brings us to now today, why now? Why now are we really focusing on DEI? Going just back two years ago, where we're dealing with the pandemic and all of us working in an insular manner like we are right now in all of our respective areas, kind of like in these little cubes, right? And so what we found was this, this topic we called the great resignation, where people were really reflecting on what's important to them now and what we found was that it, it really sparked a conversation of internal dialogue saying, do I really want to be here? And a lot of employers were dealing with a massive resignation and, and they were struggling with trying to backfill those jobs. So that really was um, part of that pandemic um, you know, backlash. And then we got to the return to work. So now things are starting to open back up again. And people were feeling that sense of anxiety. I was comfortable here working remote. Some people were saying, I, I actually don't want to go back to, to that work environment in the cubicles in the office. And the evolution of hoteling where people would go in just on certain days, um, creating those safety protocols to now where we have folks that have those hybrid remote work environments where we live in these cubes a lot, having these Zoom interactions, teams and alike, you know, we're meeting more frequently face-to-face, -face, but virtually. Um, and a lot of folks are saying that this is great, but I feel a bit of burnout when it comes to um, being in front of the computer all the time but we still need that sense of connection. So this is why in terms of looking at DEI, it is incumbent on part, all of us to say, we need to create a sense of community and find ways to connect because the only way that we're really going to evolve in terms of diversity is through that connection. Because right now we're together, but we're apart. We're not always in the same room 
more and more we are, but we still are dealing with this new reality of the new world that we've, we've, we have actually established as a result of coming out of this pandemic. So it's going to be important for us to have these crucial conversations, to be transparent, and to create safe environments where we can work across the boundaries and create an environment of psychological safety. So why is DEI important in terms of a value proposition? It's simply because it's good for business. We want to make sure that we are reaching across all barriers to, to really focus on how can we attract the best and the brightest? And how do we do that? By looking at how we're going to look at an organization in terms of making it more productive to get those dialogues going from different perspectives. Wouldn't it be boring if we all thought alike? This whole convergence of thought is what makes an organization and, and actual interactions that rich, um, profitable, productive endeavor. So diversity fosters that. And it's key for building strong relationships, both within an organization and outside of an organization and all the people that we touch. And when we're thinking about coming together to solve problems, it really is the best way to approach that. So what I'd like you to do now is to engage you in a chat. And I'd like you to take a look at the words diversity, equity, and inclusion and just open your mind and write in the chat words that come to mind when you think of the word diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I am not seeing the chat. Gina, I actually do see some comments. Oh, chat is okay, disabled. Yeah. Okay. I thought I saw team friend culture, leveling playing field. Do you see some of the comments coming in acceptance? I am not. But if you wouldn't mind, just you could just read them out. So acceptance, team. Marginalized groups, involvement, equality, belonging. Yes, all those things, exactly. So that, that is perfect. So I'm seeing it under the q and I think. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, having a seat at the table, inclusion, accept who you are and welcoming. Yes, all those things. So absolutely, I love it. I love seeing all that. So it is all of those things, that sense of belonging that, you know, could be parental status, you know, whether you think that, you know, leaving the um, work early because you need to take care of your family might, might you know, be part of that tapestry, military status, um, geography, talent, um, your experiences, um, critical, crucial conversations, all these different things is, is all part of that. So that is fantastic. I love that. So that is very much a part of this diversity, equity, inclusion discussion. So when we look at diversity, it's more than just race. A lot of folks think, oh, okay, so it, we're talking about diversity. It, it's, it's a racial issue. It's more than that. It is racial, but it's also about one's ethnicity, gender, sexuality, identity, social economic status, age, marital status, talents, physical abilities, the neurodivergence, religious beliefs, political beliefs, ideologies, and alike. So it, it's how you can kind of slice a pie, but then slice it again. It's, it's all these different things. That, that bring us together where everyone is an individual and everyone is different. And when you celebrate those differences in terms of equality, looking for equal and a fair treatment and access, that's what we're thinking about and fairness. And then the sense of inclusion, which brings us back to that sense of belonging. And we all have our own definition of what belonging is, right? Um, so, um, providing equal opportunity. So I have a, 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 a way of looking at 
uh, diversity as that human range of differences and that each one of us brings that to the table and we have to celebrate that. And, and so in doing that, we want to look at equality versus um, equity versus equality. So you, I love this. And I'm sure that maybe some of you have seen this um, visual before. And you see right here, they're all at given access to the same resources, which you might consider to be equal. But as far as accessibility or access, you'll see that they don't have the same view of the ballpark. By, by staking these same resources, you can still make sure that everybody has access to the resources that are able to, to allocate so that everyone has that equal outcome so that everyone has a view of that ballpark. Um, where we wanna get to is where we're not just stacking the deck in one area, but to the point where there are no barriers. And the other aspect of this in terms of, of a way to look at this is making sure that we have access. So you'll see same type of, of visual on the left, where you'll see that, you know, access as far as providing them with the resources, those boxes, but not giving the view. Think about what people lose by not just creating that ramp to just make sure that everyone has the ability to actually get that view of the ballpark, that one small thing. And, and one might say, well, you know, it, it, you know, this will take resources, but as far as being able to attract those kind of thoughts and have that talent and have the, the human experience, it's such a small thing, but with a big impact. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about equity and access. The inclusion piece is valuing everyone's perspective and contribution. The environment where everyone feels supported and really listened to and everyone's voice has value. And you have that sense of what we call psychological safety that is pervasive in an organizational culture. The only way that this is going to really make an impact ongoing, it's not an event. This is not just a sprint. This is a marathon. This is not just an event. This is a journey in terms of DEI, thinking about it in those terms and how we can affect our organizational culture as it affects that. So we want that sense of belonging where the equity, the diversity and the inclusion really does come together in terms of a sense of belonging where everyone feels valued, where everyone feels respected, where everyone feels empowered so that they can you know, be the best version of themselves. And belonging again means different things to different people. I, I know that early in my career, I was very often the only, the only female in a group. And, um, you know, the, the, I felt as if I was invisible a lot of times. So, you know, that sense of invisibility or that your, your voice doesn't matter, or that your, your experiences don't matter, that you're diminished is very important. And that sense of belonging where you are empowered and valued makes a big difference. And the sense of psychological safety. So when we think about psychological safety in which human beings feel included, that sense of belonging, safe to learn, safe to contribute, safe to challenge the status quo um, without that, that fear of being embarrassed, called out, punished. Like, what do you mean by that? And in a way where they feel like what they're saying doesn't make sense in the room, you want to invite those dialogues as far as that psychological safety or that you're not feeling that marginalization or that there's going to be a backlash just because your, your ideas don't agree or mesh with, with the collective thought in the room. So I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna hopefully be able to um, see your chat. I'm going to get out of chat and back into chat. And hopefully I'll be able to see. And Gina, we're using mm -hmm. Q and A. So I would instruct everyone to put all of the responses in Q&A so we can see them. 
Oh, great. Okay. I can see Q&A. Yes. All right. So, uh, so chat was disabled. Okay. I got it. Yes. Okay. okay. So fantastic. So I'm just going to put up some images and I just like to get your thoughts about what you see in terms of your perception. So when you look at this image, what do you see? Friends, that's the response I see right now. Okay, okay. I can see it now. Yeah. Okay, I, great. I, I'm with you. I'm with you now. Okay. <laughs> a group of kids, college kids, a group of friends. Yes. Youth, happy friends, inclusion. Thomas, great. Um, everybody, I see Aaron. Yeah, happiness and togetherness. A selfie, yes. Yeah, so you know what's interesting? Multicultural, and that was from an anonymous attendee, but I, I think that's a very interesting comment that you saw that this is a, a multicultural group. Um, what I, I did, unity, togetherness. Yes, diverse group of friends. I love it. Inclusion. Yeah. So um, great. And and so um, what about this picture? Teamwork, collaboration, women, teaching, engaged women, working, evaluation, three women of three different backgrounds. Yes, powerful women working together. Yeah, teamwork, lean in and engage, multicultural, diverse female engagement, collaboration, business women, yeah. Dialogue, different points of view, strong women, problem solving, sharing. Yeah, so all those things. So what we're seeing shows on the surface and there's some things that we don't see as well. Last one, last one is what do you see here? Friends, love, affection, kindness, joy, and love. Two men laughing, buddies, partners, humor, celebration, kindness. Yes, joy, caring, friends, loving couple, fun, close friends or lovers, love and acceptance, accomplishment, acceptance, love for one another, all of these things, fun happy couple, inclusion and happiness, closeness. So this is great, camaraderie, bonding. And, and Rich, you, you said, I don't see eye contact in any of these examples. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, One-sided relationship potentially, wow, okay. So maybe in this one, you know, he's hugging the guy and the guy's engaged in his phone. So I see what you're saying. Well, that's an interesting um, comment that there are no eye contact. I hadn't thought about that. So that's interesting. So when we think about the things that we see and, and we engage people all the time as we might call spectators and people see us, they don't necessarily see the whole picture. And, and there are lots of times that people make assumptions based on what is showing on the surface. And, and we're more than the sum of the total of our parts. So there are things about us that people will just make a conclusion without getting to know us. And in terms of diversity and equity and inclusion, it really is about getting to know, making that effort to get to really know someone. So I, I wanna talk about this concept of I am, but I'm not. So when you look at someone, 
you might think they, they are all the things that you assume of them, but what are the things that maybe they're not that you'd want someone to know about you? Like, for example, in my case, I am a woman, but I am not a mother. So that's an example. What would be one for you? I am, but I am not. This might take some reflection. So I am not arrogant, but what are you? Neurotypical. So you're neurotypical, but what are you? So I want to see, I am this, but I'm not that. Yeah. So I'm in a relationship, but I'm not married. Yes. I'm always smiling, but I'm not always happy. I am active, but I'm not an athlete. Yes. I love this. I am a part of a family of origin but I do not agree with all of their beliefs. Wow, I love this, okay? I am a blonde, but I am not ditzy. Yes, I am a parent, but I am not a wife. Wow, yes, I am a mother, but I am not, I've never been pregnant. Yes, experienced, but not an expert. I'm a great grandmother, but I'm not old or done. <laughs> ah, I love it. I'm a feminist, but I'm not, every feminist. I'm a leader, but I'm not a boss. These are fantastic. Confident. I'm a facilities management, but I'm not a man. Wow. I'm married, but I'm not a father. These are fantastic. These are fantastic. I am a cancer survivor, but I am not defined by it. Wow, Robbie. Thank you. I'm older, but I'm not done learning. I'm an introvert, but I am fun to be with. I am happy, but I am not conceited. I'm divorced, I'm all out. These are fantastic. I'd like to like make a, a, a blanket, a tapestry of all of these. There's so many. Um, I am fat, but I'm not lazy. Full up, me too. Um, I'm a caregiver, but I'm not defined as such. I could just go on and on. I'm a Muslim, but I'm not a terrorist. Wow, wow, yes. I'm a widow, but I'm not old. I'm an entrepreneur, but not yet successful. These are fantastic. I'm confident, but I'm not cocky. I really love these. And I thank you all so much for sharing these. These are so powerful. These are so powerful. And they're powerful because we are so many things. And some of them show on the surface and some of them don't show. And, and so we want to talk about that as we dig further into this whole topic of diversity. I wish we could just, I'm a girl, but I'm not dumb. I'm Mexican, but I'm not a drug dealer. <laughs> wow. I love it. Um, and so, um, so um, Billy, the questions, are comments going to be in the final posting? Um, I hope, hopefully we'll be able to, to capture some of these, but I, I, I think that these are really powerful statements. So thinking about that, bringing all the parts of us together, all the things that we want to celebrate, celebrating all the parts of ourselves is, is critical and crucial in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, that we all come together and some of the things that we are show and some don't. And when we, the evolution of having diversity in the workplace used to be more focused on gender, race, LGBTQIA, disability and age, but now it's evolving into being more inclusive to think about things like family status and socioeconomics, veteran status, thinking styles. I mean, we can't all think alike. How, I guess I've said this before, but how boring would it be if we all thought alike? You know, the languages that we speak and and just, you know, disabilities and abilities and, and just experience. So all those things are converging on going from diverse to inclusive, the evolution of that. Now, as, as much as we have talked about what DEI is, it's equally important to talk about some of the things that do get in the way of valuing DEI. And so the, the, the barriers can come from just inaccurate 
perceptions of what others and other others have thought about you and also things that you have thought about other people. And that brings us to this topic of unconscious bias. And we walk around with biases that come from our collective experience and we're kind of wired that way. Now, what I challenge us to do is to really embrace those biases, really reflect on those and ask where they came from and to kind of be open to why you think that way and to look at people as individuals and stereotyping people just based on generalizations and treating people based on a label that you've given them or they've given you. Um, I, I know that, you know, there've been situations that I've been in. I think I told, uh, shared with the group that I, you know, for 20 years before the pandemic, I taught spinning at a health club. And I know that my, my goal in teaching that class was to make everybody feel safe and welcome and to make sure that they felt that they could be successful. I was not one of those instructors that wanted to beat you up or get in your face. But I also had other people tell me offline that they were uh, intimidated by my class from the outside looking in and felt like I was somehow excluding them, which actually hurt me to hear that I didn't give them that sense of belonging because that was really my goal. But I also felt like if they had walked in the studio, they would not have felt that way, getting closer to the situation. So in terms of barriers, just diving a little bit more into that unconscious bias and exploring assumptions. Unconscious bias are those learned stereotypes, thinking about where they might come from. Some of them are unintentional, uh, ingrained. Um, they, they come from the behavior. Where, where do you think, and I'm gonna look at the, the chat, the comments here. Um, where do you think some of these unconscious biases come from, from where you sit and what maybe you've experienced? Some of it could be even from like social media and, and just, you know, just getting influence from the outside in. Parents, school media, <laughs> the Kardashians, <laughs> Daniel, you're funny. Um, familiar, learned behavior, parents. Yes. Um, so... Sure, you said that you've had people tell you that you're intimidating, but when they describe why, it seems centered on your confidence and your tendency to make eye contact. So they're interpreting your confidence and eye contact as intimidation, where you just might be trying to make a connection. Society, um, childhood experience, yes. TV, right? Uh, TikTok. Um, you know, so we're living in this really fast paced world, TV friends, old country, narrow points of view. So from wherever you sit there, there could be all these different things that converge on, on all of us that, that play a role in this unconscious bias. Yeah. So, um, this is great. The social circle, generational bias, Michelle. Yes. And we're going to talk about that religion exposure and experience, old stereotypes, right? Economy and background and culture and political parties. Wow. Yeah. So there've been a lot of big digital divides there too. So all these things play a role in unconscious bias. And in a lot of times people think their perception is reality and to them it is. So selectively looking at someone and making an assumption that because you're making eye contact, because you're confident, you must be arrogant or you must be, you know, um, an intimidating figure. So a lot of it's based on misinformation. So keeping an open mind and realizing that, you know, maybe the way we've always thought might not be the way we could think to challenge ourselves to do that. The stereotypes are those generalizations are the things that you all listed here so eloquently, those labels that people give that are not based on factual information or just on a small group of people. Like, you know, I don't represent my, my entire, you know, um, group. My, my father's from the West Indies. My mother is American. You know, I'm a convergence of culture. 
So I'm a person of color, I'm a woman, um, a woman of a certain age, I'm a woman of a certain size, all these different things make up who I am, right? But I don't represent all those things to all people. So if someone experiencing me may take that and export that, but that's not who we all are. And the labels, you know, that are given to people is, is critical. They, they attribute to, you know, maybe past behavior or how you might've been treated. So you might've been treated a certain way where you were discriminated against um, and, um, you know, labels that we give ourselves, you know? Um, so the, the question is, do you think that these biases are both sides? In an example of your spinning class, was the bias returned to the expression to you? Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what that meant, but, um, it wasn't my, you know, we have intent and we have impact. So um, if we're talking about my intention, my intention was never to um, have a biases against anybody in my class because I would always meet them wherever they were. Um, if they didn't get to know me or walk into the studio, they could walk away with a certain perception, right? Labeling me as maybe a taskmaster. Maybe that would have been my label there, but that's not how the class was. Um, my intention was to be welcoming, but there is that 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 um, whole notion of intent versus impact. So even though my intention was to be uh, welcoming, if they felt excluded, that's still their reality. So you know you still have to be able to own that and and open up those dialogues. And the fact that that person told me that invited that that um, opportunity to take place and that's where the connection really has the magic sauce so that was a great question though thank you so getting beyond unconscious bias stereotype and labeling is to first recognize that we have them you know to say things like i don't see color or you know i know I, I i'm not a biased person is is not necessarily being real with yourself we all have these things. They come from all the different um, different areas that you listed here. And to be mindful to just say, you know, I'm not going to act upon this to sort of check yourself and to know that, you know, people are, are people versus just what we have these conceived notions or preconceived notions. And to also really try to make a connection with someone and see them as an individual, as opposed to what we see on the outside. And then the aspect of emotional intelligence comes in, the aspect of impulse control to really think before you speak, you know, kind of check yourself before you wreck yourself, you know, not to say everything that just pops into your mind. So that's important too, as far as making sure that we're not making that negative impact on other people. Now, when we're dealing with people with a disability, whether it's physical or it's a neurodiversity, um, we want to make sure that we don't talk down to someone based on what we see, that we're care careful as far as using negative terms to describe a person's ability or disability, whether it's physical or mental, um, that if you are offering assistance, um, that you ask permission to do so. And, you know, just things like if you're dealing with someone who's in a wheelchair, not to invade their space and know that all disabilities are not apparent to the eye. So, um, and that, that whole aspect of neurodiversity is important, meeting people where they are. And then we get to language barriers. You know, the, the United States is a melting pot. The other part of this is now that we've opened up the world as far as this digital world, we're dealing with people in different parts of the world, time zones, a lot of different languages and cultures converging. And, and I know as someone learning another language, um, it, you have to be really patient. And when you're talking to someone who speaks another language, you think, wow, I mean, not only are they, you know, um, speak maybe one, two, or more languages, but they're able to conduct business in another language. So, you know, cut them some slack as far as, you know, expression, 
I mean, or, or, or not make the assumption that because someone is kind of translating in real time in their head, that maybe that their, their brilliance is not behind that. So be patient, you know, um, try to avoid using those slang terms and, and be comfortable in those slow pauses and allow them to finish their thought. So in terms of, of, of that, now we get to this, and someone had mentioned this earlier, generations. So in the workplace, we've got a big generational divide. We've got people that are staying in the workforce longer and longer these days. Um, so to be aware of that, um, as far as those stereotypes for older people and for younger people as well. So not dismissing someone just because they're young and valuing contributions regardless of age and be aware that there is that sense of ageism as it relates to comments like this whole notion of, okay, boomer, um, you know, when you hear that term, you know, it's like kind of patting an old person on the head, like, you know, you, you, you're not keeping up. You, what do you know? Um, you, you just have like old thoughts and ideas or to on the other side, dealing with someone that is a Gen Z and assume that they don't have much to, to offer because they're only addicted to, you know, their, their social media, that they're all about getting followed and the likes and, and the world is all around, you know, just fast TikTok bites of information and they don't have anything to offer. People are more than that. And so to be aware of those generational issues. So, you know, going right now in the workplace, we probably have five generations working in the workplace. Maybe in your homes, you might have multiple generations. And to realize that that's part of the diversity tapestry. And then we go back to our organizations and hierarchy and realizing that based on position in an organization that some people may have labels accordingly. So regardless of where you are in the organization, we want to make sure that we treat people with respect, regardless of title. So knowing that at the very core of all of us, we are all human, and this is a human condition, and respect the person. It doesn't matter what the title is. So keeping that in mind as far as, as diversity and cultural differences. So realizing that when people come from this, this global perspective that we live in today, that they may show up in a way that we may not be familiar with and to be open to that, to realize that their, their practices and their customs may differ from ours, but are equally as valuable and give them space to be different and to celebrate those. But also know that in terms of cultural differences, there might be some things that may be uh, affecting our personal buffer zones, you know, like where, where someone might be closer to you than you're, more, you're usually call, um, call comfortable being, um, that the, the way that conflict is dealt with might be different. Um, recognizing that their approach as to how decisions are made may not really converge with yours or yours might be different than theirs, but to be open to these cultural differences. And so knowing that, you know, learning more about what someone else's culture and customs is important and realizing that people are individuals is important. So how do we create this culture of empathy? You know, when we think about the word empathy, we think about, you know, putting ourselves in other people's shoes. But the other part of that is really feeling with the other person. So making sure that we are trying not to commit those unconscious bias uh, acts or microaggressions um, that we hear. Um, I see, Fola, you had written, I'm a black woman, but I'm not angry. Like if someone made that assumption about you in a way that made you feel uncomfortable, that could be an unconscious bias or to ask you a question in a way, like if you're in a meeting, like asking you, hey, are, are you feel a little angry here? That, that could be a microaggression. So to be aware of that is important and understanding what it means to belong is, is building that culture of empathy, a space that we can celebrate 
you know, the, the collective joys, the obstacles, and also give ourselves room to make mistakes and self-correct and have those candid conversations that we take place and to stand behind, stand next to, I'm sorry, stand next to and behind those who are marginalized, create that sense of allyship. Those are things that we can do to start to bridge those barriers. So let me ask you a question. Um, what is the one thing more than anything else that you think that you can do to embrace DEI in your workplaces and your day-to-day? -day? What's that one thing that you think that you're willing to do and that you've done? Asking questions with intent, to learn and allow openness and understanding the response. Yes, to talk about it, I love it. Respectful to all, bring everyone to the table. Yes, listen to it with an open mindset. Yes, listen, listen. You know, it's so interesting that I'm seeing listen again and again and again, because listening is a very um, simple skill but not easy, um, simple, but not easy because most of us live in that selective listening where you're just listening to just jump on off and make your point. I love this work to get to know people as individuals. Yes, a re I'm working on a stating a resource group at my university called U Chicago Women in STEM. Right on, I love it. Stay engaged in the moment. Recognizing is a lifelong learning situation. Yes, this is a journey. I love this. Speaking up. That remember in that that video, just being able to speak up. These are fantastic. Love one another. Learn to appreciate everybody's differences and embrace them. Do my best in expect and accepting of others regardless of differences. Yes, ask the question, how do I participate? So these are really fantastic. I love this. And so um, what I wanted to talk about here is what you all said, which is that this is a marathon, not a sprint. It's a journey, not a destination. It's ongoing. And in doing that, we want to make sure that we are recognizing these diversities, that we're respecting one another, that we're making those real connections, and that we're, we're also taking time to, to familiarize ourselves with what's going around us like familiarizing ourselves with these terms, like the terms that like LGBTQIA, like the, the IA, well, I don't think it was there a, a, couple, a number of years ago. So what does that mean? Or distinguishing between when someone talks about one's sex or gender or gender identity or transgender versus transsexual, you hear a lot you know, talking about, you know, being cis or non-binary. So being familiar with those terms. And, and so that, that's um, very important in terms of build, building these um, barriers or bridging those barriers. So what do these mean? And like the use of pronouns. So you notice that in a lot of um, emails now, people close with their pronouns. Um, so, you know, on the bottom of mine, she, her, hers, you know, so, or he, him, his, or they, they're them, making sure that now pronouns are shared so that we avoid these assumptions, the stereotypes, that we ask questions from a place of really caring. And we, um, you know, understand that if someone is using someone's correct pronoun, it's really affirming to them that you see them and they and increasing that sense of belonging and that you are an ally in a sense. Now, for some of us, it might be difficult to, to wrap our minds around maybe the they, they're them because grammatically there's another association and giving other people room to make those mistakes and then bringing them along the way, making sure that we are still engaging them. So I just want to, you know, leave you again with those strategies, which is respecting others and their individualities to listen again, which is what many of you all said without judgment and being respectful of people's different points of view and communication styles 
And also, you know, um, being willing to talk, listen, learn, and remain open. I love that I saw that in your comments and speaking out when you hear insensitive remarks and discriminatory, be discriminatory behaviors against others, um, respecting and supporting differences in our institutions, communities, acting as a role model. You know, this whole human diversity is a gift and accepting and celebrating all of us is just gonna be a happier, more productive world that we live in and really embrace this diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. So there are things that we can do at work, um, which is to you know come up with, um, find out what's going on in your organization from a variety of different ways to come up with a strategy like, like you are in your university that you had mentioned. Um, practices, establish a DEI task force or initiative, implement this within your organization, um, involve leadership, create a task team, and incorporating it into your culture, and then evaluate how it's going periodically. So what I would say is, you know, we want to start at the top, revamp reward systems, don't assume similar values or opinions, and then continuously monitor this as far as cultivating DI in your organizations. So I'm gonna kind of bring this together. And I know that maybe at the end I went fast, but this is all gonna be provided for you in, in the, the documentation that will be on the website. But let's just to be sure to remain mindful in creating an inclusive workplace acknowledge and celebrate differences, try to develop your own strategies, whether it's personal or at work in terms of your level of cultivating diversity, equity and inclusion in all of your relationships and practice being more inclusive and encourage that sense of belonging, you know, like really making sure you're making that connection both at home and at work. So I, I wanna thank you. And I wanna just say to be the change you wish to see in the world. And, and this has just been such a wonderful experience to be with all of you. And I thank you so much. And at this point, I'm going to, um, again, encourage you to just stay open and turn things back to you, Holly. Nina, thank you so much. This has been an amazing webinar, a lot of uh, takeaways and little nuggets of learning, and I appreciate and thank you for it. Um, I'd like to thank everybody else who has stayed with us through this whole entire webinar, and I hope you've enjoyed it. As mentioned, we will have this recording available to you within 24 hours or an hour DEI um, web page um, under resources. Uh, but within 24 hours. And um, I also invite you to join us for our next DEI webinar, which will be May 17th. And uh, we'll be welcoming back Keith Woodward and having discussions on thin words to thick actions. And res reservate registration for that is also open. So again, Gina, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, you, your information is here. People would like to contact you, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to APA staff. Thank you all. Thank you.